it makes it real. All right, hey, uh, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming out on this very sunny day, as I was just saying. Um, it's a special pleasure to be talking about something potentially so depressing with you all <laughs> on such a wonderful day. It's hard to depress an audience, I think, uh, at least those of you who are here. Uh, and maybe we will come up with something uplifting at the end. So uh, first, welcome. Thanks uh, for coming. I'm Chris Nichols. Um, uh, in my hat today, I'm uh, here as the co-founder uh, and director of our Citizenship and Crisis Initiative. Uh, but I'm also a historian here at OSU, and I direct our Center for the Humanities. Um, uh, this series started uh, now five years ago uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of World War I, and we found that talking about the relationship between citizenship and crisis, war and peace, some of the most existential threats, as well as opportunities um, to democracy, to the West, to the world, uh, climate change, all kinds of subjects actually really resonated well, not just from the World War I context, obviously, but in the present. So now the series has taken on a life of its own. We've found some donors, some foundations have gotten involved. We've got a great uh, group of folks involved. Most importantly, uh, we have a fantastic internship program. We get some competitive interns every year. Uh, and this year, this panel was uh, is the perk, the main perk of our interns. Um, our great intern, Amber Tolerud, uh, conceived of this, organized it, set it all up, so she will be help help uh, teeing up the main themes here. She found all the panelists. Uh, and so this is the brainchild of uh, our, our great intern this year. Um, but it's also one of many panels we've done on questions about the Electoral College, American democracy, uh, new regulations and regimes related to democracy in the US and around the world in a comparative context. Uh, and I think it's really struck a vein. Uh, we, we continue to have good audiences um, and addressing these questions. And it's very clear to me from teaching here and talking to our students that this is something that's uh, it's vitally important for the next generation. So whatever we all have to say, hopefully you guys um, can help uh, enact meaningful change um, to make this a more representative democracy in whatever form that you want. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce our intern, uh, uh, Amber, uh, who will set this whole thing up. So Amber, take it away. Well, I'm glad to have you all here today for what should be a very informative panel regarding voter suppression in the United States. As lead intern for Citizenship with Your Isis Initiative, like Dr. Nichols said, one of my most rewarding opportunities I've had is to plan an event that I view at being at the intersection of crisis and citizenship. So we were able to recruit some amazing panelists for you um, today, and um, they should each talk for roughly 10 minutes. And after that, we'd like to open up the floor for a nice discussion with you, the audience. And we aim to finish up around 5.30. So on that note, if any of you guys need to leave early, please, please feel free to do so quietly, as well as um, please make sure to silence your cell phone during the event. And uh, if you haven't already, please take the opportunity to go sign in in the back on the sign-up sheets. We have the gray one for community members and faculty and the orange one for students. So if you're here for extra credit, that especially applies to you. And I'd like to first introduce Dr. Smith from the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. She'll be starting us off with a historical look at the um, roots of voter suppression in the United States. And then we have Dr. Silbert from the School of Public Policy. She'll be talking about um, cases, current or recent cases pertaining to voter ID laws in the United States. And then we have Dr. Stout, last but certainly not least, who will be talking about, um, and he's from the School of Public, Pol Public Policy as well, and he will be talking about um, recent occurrences of voter suppression. Yeah, thank, and again, thank you for being here. And, Volunteering your time. Here. So let me go ahead and get started. Thanks so much uh, to Amber Tolerud and to Dr. Nichols for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, it'll become pretty clear that I'm a 19th century U.S. historian and that uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is the point that I'm bringing you to today, is pretty. I kind of out of my comfort zone, but I'm kind of give us a history of how we get to the Voting Act, uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965, which will be pretty important uh, to the story that my colleagues are going to be giving you here. Uh, so the first thing I really want to say uh, is that we need to remember that uh, for a long time in U.S. history, voting rights, uh, who was allowed to vote and who was not, were a, was a matter that was left up to the states. And you see the map here, for instance, that uh, prior to the American Civil War, many states restricted the right to vote 
uh, based on economic status. So whether you own property, specifically if you own real estate, whether you pay taxes, right? these could be uh, the different kinds of criteria that states would use to uh, restrict your voting rights if you were an adult white man. And it isn't really up until the you know, 1840s that most of the states start to actually get rid of these property restrictions. And so it's just an important point that before 1870, uh, the, this was pretty much a state matter. Now that changed in 1870 with the 15th Amendment that you're probably uh, familiar with. Uh, the text of it is right there. It's a very short amendment, but something I want to point out about it that uh, sometimes we forget is that uh, the 15th Amendment does not include a positive guarantee or affirmation of the right to vote. Instead, it has uh, what some legal scholars call a state action clause, which is essentially it prevents the states from restricting the right to vote based on uh, color, race, or previous condition of servitude. So it's not actually saying that everyone has the right to vote or that certain people have the right to vote, but instead it prevents the states from using certain characteristics to discriminate against voters. Okay, and that's going to be really important to the, to the story that we talk about here. Uh, so in the wake of the 15th Amendment, and most of you are probably pretty, you know, somewhat familiar with this story, right? African-American men have uh, eventually get the right to vote uh, because the states can no longer, southern states can no longer uh, discriminate against them. But of course, voter suppressions suppression happens in a violent and extra legal way. Uh, so during the Reconstruction era, we see uh, the you know, violent intimidation of black men as they try to go to the polls. We have a couple of cartoons from Thomas Nast here. This one is uh, very poignant called One Vote Less, showing a murdered African-American man who's trying to exercise his right to vote. Uh, and the one from really after the end of Reconstruction, uh, talk, it, essentially it's a group of white men holding guns to a black man's head and saying, of course he wants to vote the Democratic ticket. Uh, so in this case, not so much voter suppression, but forcing someone to vote in a particular kind of way is, is the implication. Uh, now, African Americans, though, during Reconstruction did have support for their voting rights, right? So the, in, in response to this extra legal violence, the federal government, which had been occupying the South uh, with the US military, used military force to ensure that African American men would have uh, the right to vote as much as possible. The uh, military registered voters, protected polling places, and uh, as these images show, right, these are all Thomas Nast images. Right, you've got the uh, soldier here on uh, the left-hand panel who's protecting an African-American. And the, he's got the word civil rights uh, in his hand. Uh, and then here, too, you have on the right-hand side a depiction of a US soldier defending the honesty and liberty of the ballot box against uh, basically a former Confederate soldier who's also identified with the KKK. So the notion here is that military force is extremely important to preventing voter suppression. But of course, as we saw in the last examples, that violence is pretty intense. Uh, and it intensifies as the federal commitment to the occupation of the former Confederacy declines across the 1860s and 1870s. So from a force of 160, excuse me, 187,000, I don't know why I'm looking there when I could look here, 187,000 uh, troops right after the end of the Civil War, uh, there's a, a decline down to only 6,000 troops across the entire Confederacy by uh, 1876. And uh, as troop withdrawals happen, Voter suppression becomes more and more common, and if you know anything about your U.S. presidential elections, the uh, election of 1876 was particularly contested uh, because of Democrats committing voter suppression through violence and also uh, tampering with the ballot through all kinds of different types of fraud. Eventually, the result of that election uh, is that uh, the federal government, I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but the federal government eventually pulls 
troops out of the occupied South, essentially leaving the region to white Democrats, many of them former Confederates, uh, and had been involved in these uh, campaigns of violence against African Americans. Uh, we eventually descend into the era of Jim Crow. Uh, this is a, a good illustration of some of the attitudes of the southern states. This is uh, Senator, U.S. Senator from South Carolina, Ben Tillman, who deliberately said, right, outright, uh, quote, we do our best to keep every Negro in our state from voting, right, and sort of openly declared this, and this is a cartoon that's lamenting this in 1897, essentially saying this is the path back to slavery. Well, how are they doing that? Well, uh, famously, and you probably know about this already, uh, literacy and citizenship tests. Uh, and this is happening as early as 1879, right after Reconstruction. Here you have Thomas Nast showing essentially a poor white man who's writing in a very illiterate way, saying African Americans aren't educated enough to vote. And of course, the irony of the joke that Nast is telling here is that the person who wants African Americans not to vote because they're supposedly illiterate and uneducated is himself pretty illiterate and uneducated. Uh, just to kind of give you an example of how these evolve, this one is actually uh, from pretty late. This is from uh, circa 1955. The literacy tests uh, and citizenship tests are pretty complicated. You've probably seen examples on the internet where they have all these kind of crazy things you have to do, like draw a circle around these letters and all of these kinds of impossible tasks. This is actually an interesting uh, example from Mississippi uh, from 1965, where essentially the person who is conducting the election uh, says, basically, you tell the voter to write a a portion of the state constitution in a box, right, to prove that you're literate and that you can know how to, that you know how to write. Uh, and then number 19, write a reasonable interpretation of the section of the constitution that the person has chosen for you. Number 20, write in the space below a statement setting forth your understanding of the duties and obligations of citizenship under a constitutional form of government. Right? And so, of course, what are the right and wrong answers here? And uh, you may be asking yourself, could I do this if I was presented with a random portion of the Mississippi Constitution? Probably not. Now, we know that uh, in many southern states, poor whites didn't, weren't able to meet some of these requirements, especially if there were poll taxes involved, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and in some states in Louisiana, that was actually fine for some leaders for a while because they wanted to suppress uh, dissent by poor whites in the South. Eventually, though, most of the states begin to adopt the so-called grandfather clauses, which essentially state, as this uh, document does here, that uh, if you can't pass the literacy test and all these sorts of things, as long as you can prove that your you had an ancestor, you're directly descended from somebody who could vote um, in 1867, then you were grandfathered in to the ability to vote. Right? So this is to allow white people who can't pass the, the literacy test to be, or other kinds of restrictions like poll taxes, uh, to be able to vote. Here's an example of a poll tax. A poll it does not mean a place, uh, like a place where you vote. A poll in this era means a, a head tax, essentially. And so each uh, person is charged a head tax, essentially, for themselves, sometimes for the members of their family, and they have to pay that in order to be able to vote. So if you can't pay that, you may be able, if you're a, a poor white person, to get grandfathered out of that. The 19th Amendment, <laughs> we're going pretty fast. Oh, I'm almost at my 10 minutes. The 19th Amendment uh, is, the follow, uh, is a follow-up to the 15th Amendment. Many of us know that uh, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Right? And so we generally think of this as the women's suffrage amendment. Uh, but it was complicated in this era. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of pushback from the whites in the southern states, including some white women themselves, who are worried that women's suffrage will enfranchise African-American women. And part of the worry about that is that Afri it'll be much harder for people who want to intimidate voters at the polls from going and intimidating black women because they have, you know, there's certain sorts of norms about gender where you're <coughs> supposed to, you know, 
uh, enact violence against women. And so there's kind of a concern that maybe black women will be the opening wedge into opening up the polls to uh, African Americans in general. What we see as a result of all of these laws, it's not, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not rocket science here, but essentially we see the voting, African American voting rights uh, in these states declining very, very rapidly. The graph here um, essentially shows that only tiny percentages of African Americans are able to vote by 1961, which is when the federal government uh, conducts a, a study of several important counties in the South. So you see here some have like a 60% population, some counties but only 1.6 are registered to vote. So it just kind of gives you uh, an idea about the extremity. Uh, the same commission that looked into voting rights looked into the different circumstances that led to this kind of intimidation or this, this type of suppression. Some is direct, uh, a direct result of the literacy and citizenship tests that are virtually impossible to pass. Uh, if you take a few, uh, just a sampling of these here, I don't know that I'm gonna have time to talk about them all, but essentially African Americans are reporting to this federal commission that they're being threatened with economic sanctions. They're being threatened, uh, by, which, by which we mean they're gonna be fired if they don't, uh, if they try to register to vote. Some are uh, threatened with physical violence, including uh, one down here in Louisiana in Madison Parish in July 1960. Some people who went to go and register referred to the sheriff, which was taken as uh, essentially a not too subtle form of intimidation, it says. Right? Uh, so we see voting rights become one of the central pillars of uh, the civil rights movement in addition to uh, desegregation. Uh, there's a lot of activism around uh, the right to vote. It became uh, a major uh, kind of cause for the civil rights movement, especially in the Mississippi burning case, right? These were uh, activists who were going south to help register uh, people to vote. And the outrage over the violence that's happening, especially the violence against the nonviolent protesters in places like Selma and the murders of these civil rights activists, uh, kind of generate pressure. The federal government finally passes the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, that's supposed to be a remedy to this. And essentially, uh, what it does is that it, it has greater oversight of elections in those counties where we see very low African-American registration rates. Uh, those counties have to get um, permission from the U.S. Attorney General uh, to change their voting laws. Uh, and there are efforts in conjunction with that to get rid, I mean, certainly the, there's already uh, a constitutional amendment against poll taxes in national elections, and there's an effort on the Attorney General's office to challenge poll taxes at the state level as well. And we see, and this is gonna be my last slide, and we're gonna run right over. Um, we see that the act is pretty successful in its immediate wake, uh, right? Uh, the, we've got March 1965 on the left, September 1967 on the right, and we see that African American uh, voting, which is the orange, uh, people registered to vote, has in, increased many, many fold as a result of this act. It's most, uh, kind of, you know, radical act about voting since the Reconstruction era and, and the most important piece of legislation uh, that ensured the right to vote. Now my colleagues here are going to tell you about what happened. Okay. So good afternoon and let me quickly thank Amber and Chris for inviting me to yet another panel. Um, it's always pretty exciting to come and be part of these and it's and we all really appreciate all the hard work that goes into putting these on. Um, I am going to somehow find my, I'm going to have Amber find my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, um, I think Chris is going to time me because I'm asking him to <laughs> and saying that you'll probably have to cut me off because I have more information yeah, so than I can possibly deal with here. Um, and I misspelled Siri so just move away from that one really fast. <laughs> there we go. All right. So I'm gonna, we, we sort of tag teamed, we, we did somewhat plan it. Um, so my question, um, and I was asked to talk more about the current time period, so we've moved from history to political science, so 
um, is why does it seem like there's so many new voting laws? Why do we have this new resurgence in interest in the ideas of voter suppression? Um, well, the main, one of the main reasons um, is because the Supreme Court in 2013, um, wow, it doesn't tell me which one's there. Okay. Uh, it's a little weird. Uh, decided the case of Shelby County v. Holder. Um, and this case dealt with that Voting Rights Act that uh, Professor Smith just finished discussing. Uh, and in that case, the Supreme Court, even though Congress had reauthorized the Voting Rights Act in 2006, decided that the formula that they used in the Voting Rights Act to determine which counties had too few minorities voting based upon population um, was outdated and could not be used anymore. So that preclearance that Professor Smith mentioned um, was essentially no longer a precondition, and states could enact voting rights law or voting laws without interference with the fed from the federal government. It took about 24 hours after that decision was made before Texas enacted their first voter ID law. It was a voter ID law that they first tried to implement in 2012, but had been stopped by the, uh, the Attorney General of the United States. This law was eventually struck down by the federal courts, and they immediately passed its twin. Um, two months after this decision, North Carolina passed a very strict photo voter ID law. Um, and since about 2010, 25 states have passed voter ID laws, photo voter ID laws. Um, others have cut back on early voting, reduced the number of polling places, and created other me me measures that are often called out as suppressing the vote or at least making it much more difficult to vote. Um, these laws are often passed with the specific intention um, or interest of the state of preventing voter fraud and securing our elections, which is a legitimate state interest. But they have what legal eagles would call um, a disparate impact, meaning that the laws that are neutral on their face, everybody must come with a photo ID, right? the application of those laws falls harder on specific segments um, of the population than others. These segments are often identifiable by various identities, by their race, immigration status, and education. Conveniently or not, depending on your point of view, these variables also highly correlate with partisan identification. In other words, these laws generally benefit Republicans and disadvantage Democrats. Similarly, on the flip side, um, laws that broaden the franchise that make it easier to vote generally benefit Democrats and harm Republican interests. So in this map, if you can see color, purple is a non-strict photo voter ID, which means the voter can cast a, a ballot with an affidavit attesting to his or her identity, and that will be a regular ballot cast on, on, on election day. Blue are for strict voter, photo, photo voter ID, which means if you don't have the right um, identification, you only cast a provisional ballot and you must take extra steps within a limited amount of time to go and prove your identity after election day. Right? Um, and the table that will be next, which was again the best table, um, gives you a sense of the number of voter ID enactments from 2000 to 2016. And you can see um, that the number of orange, which is non-strict photo, photo ID, and purple are growing, and, and, um, and dark, dark are growing. Those are the photo IDs. And the green is the no ID required. And you can see that's shrinking over time in terms of what the states are doing. Um, but you can also tell that this is starting in 2000, and it's a pretty long-standing trend. So not all of this is at because of Shelby County. Just a lot of it is because of Shelby County um, from the Supreme Court. OK. Now, there has been a ton of litigation over these laws. And the Brennan Center for Justice finds that most of the recent attempts originate from states previously under preclearance, which means under that law, the 1965 Voter, uh, Voting Rights Act, and originate in states pretty much all of them that have Republican control of both their state legislature and their governorship. For example, in uh, the GOP swept the state government in Wisconsin in 2010, 
And in 2011, they passed a new strict voter ID law. This law, like North Carolina's, like Texas's, um, was struck down by the appellate courts. And I think, yep, there you go. Um, and the law was called by one judge, and when they looked at the evidence of voter impersonation fraud justifying the law, that some of the evidence of voter impersonation fraud is downright goofy, if not paranoid. Okay? Um, and the same judge as Richard Posner, who was a Reagan appointee, also wrote, there is only one motivation for imposing burdens on voting that are ostensibly designed to discourage voter, imper uh, to discourage voter impersonation fraud, and that is to discourage voting by persons likely to vote against the party responsible for imposing the burdens. So in other words, he very clearly calls out and says, the only reason these laws have been passed by the GOP is to prevent Democrats from voting. Okay? This is really similar to the Fourth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals opinion from 2016 on North Carolina's law, where the judges wrote that although the new provisions target African Americans with almost surgical precision, they constitute inapt remedies for the problems assertedly justifying them and in fact impose cures for problems that do not exist. And what judges are finding over and over again in their fact finding at the district courts and then being reaffirmed at the Court of Appeals is that the claims of voter fraud are just mistaken or that the types of fraud that these laws remedy are not the kinds of electoral problems that we have. Right? Most of these laws, what they deal with is voter impersonation, meaning Chris goes to the polls and says that he's Rory. And that just doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> For obvious yeah. reasons, but yeah. I just send my mail in though. Yeah. Um, Posner also noted that like the Bread and Center, that photo ID laws are highly correlated with states having Republican governor and Republican legislature contro um, controlling and appear to be aimed at limiting voting by minorities, particularly blacks. And again, this is because of the high correlation between race and party identification. It's also, you know, targeting blacks is a very easy way to target Democrats. Okay. 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 Uh, these are the earlier cases, but the passage of voter ID laws has not slowed. Um, it's not stopped. As of last month, the Brennan Center for Justice lists 34 voting rights cases linked um, to all kinds of voting restrictions, including voter ID laws. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to finish. Um, okay, uh, these cases are winding their ways through the courts. There's a ton of them. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, but even just last week, the New York Times reported ten the Tennessee House passed a law that um, would find community groups that submit incomplete voter registration uh, cards. Why? Because in Tennessee, there were tens of thousands of new black and Latino voters for the 2018 midterms. Um, in one county, thousands of registrations were disqualified by state officials. So now, essentially, if a, a nonprofit goes out and organizes and grabs a bunch of voter ID cards and they're not filled out appropriately, if they pay the folks that grab them, they can then be fined for each and every card that is not filled out appropriately. And if you've ever done a voter registration <coughs> drive, you know it's, you have no control over how people fill it out. Um, so Texas, the Texas Senate on the 17th of this month passed legislation that would increase criminal penalty, penalties for voting related crimes like providing false information on a voter registration. And again, I think these are all aimed at um, voter registration drives that, that uh, try to increase Democrat voting in these areas. Um, other cases, again, uh, again, that early Texas law was replaced. Um, Texas State Bill 14 was struck down by the courts. It was very quickly replaced by State Bill 5, which added one more form of ID and allowed an additional workaround if you couldn't reasonably get an ID. The district courts, the lowest courts, the trial courts of the federal system said um, that the law still discriminated against Hispanic and black voters, um, but the Fifth Circuit overturned that decision and said that any uh, suggestion that the law would intimidate uh, voters in Texas was speculative, and this was really the first time an appellate court, uh, federal appellate court, upheld a 
uh, voter ID law um, of this nature. Uh, the Supreme Court has not weighed in, really. Um, I have three cases from the Supreme Court listed up here. Clearly, I don't have time to go over them. Um, break bill comes out of North Dakota. This is a case the, the Supreme Court declined to hear um, over the dissent of Justices Kagan and Ginsburg. It was about a North Carolina law. Uh, between the primaries and the general election, North Carolina passed a new voter ID law requiring that your voter ID had to have a street address. Mm, what if you're homeless? Oh, sorry. You're homeless, you can't do this. <laughs> but they're not targeting... Right, they're not North Dakota. They're not targeting homeless. What they're targeting is Native Americans who live on the reservation and use a PO box, oh. right? Um, and this this type of law, this was this is not the first time they had been trying to pass this law since 2013, when Heidi Heitkamp won a seat um, as a Democrat in the U.S. Senate, um, and the district court thought that about 5,000 Native Americans would not be able to vote in that election. And Ginsburg was also very concerned about the confusion because when you change your voting laws between the primary and the general election, that's a pretty quick change. Um, but the court declined to get involved and that law went into effect. Um, the court in 2008 heard a voter ID law out of Indiana. Indiana required a US photo ID. And again, if you couldn't pass, have one, you only could pass a provisional ballot, then you had to visit a government office and bring an ID or sign a statement about not being able to get one. Um, this was a 6-3 decision. No, five justices never agreed on the actual opinion, so it's a plurality decision that doesn't necessarily um, create precedent. But Stevens with Kennedy and Roberts said the law was rationally related to a legitimate state interest. Thomas, Scalia, and Alito said that the Constitution gives the states power over elections and we should not be involved in this at all. And uh, Souter Ginsburg and Ginsburg, joined by Ginsburg in dissent, said this was an unconstitutional law because there's no actual evidence of fraud that needs to be fixed, and so you're imposing a burden with no reason. Okay. Um, I'm really out of time. Houston is actually a different kind of law, which is uh, a voter roll purge law came, coming out of Ohio, and the court upheld Ohio's voter purge law, which um, essentially got about a million people off the voter rolls um, because they didn't vote for a certain number of years and didn't return a postcard. And the court said, well, you're not allowed to be purged off the rolls for not voting, but this isn't, you're, this isn't for that. You also didn't return a postcard. Um, so again, most of the court is staying, they're staying out of these cases, although, um, again, evidence shows that these laws target uh, minorities, they target Democrats, they affect them much more greatly, um, but the court has pretty much stayed out of it, but when these cases do get up to the court, I don't see anything shifting, even with the new justices that are on the court, the split is going to be pretty much, I would guess, about the same. Um, anyway, so we've got that. I'm just gonna stop because I'm way over time. And it's Chris's turn. All right. Hello. Hello everyone. Thank you, Amber and Chris, for putting this uh, important discussion on. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how states can influence the composition of the electorate, which is tied to the things that my colleagues have just talked about. Um, and I guess we can start with the premise of, as Stacy mentioned, the Constitution is pretty vague about what states can and cannot do in terms of elections. And in fact, they leave a lot of discretion to the states to do what they want to do. There are some limits to this. So the 15th Amendment says that you can't uh, make it harder for people to vote based off their race. And the 19th Amendment makes it, makes it illegal to violate someone's right to vote based off of their gender. But anybody with half a brain can figure out a way to disenfranchise half of these groups without explicitly mentioning race or gender. And this is what a lot of people have done. And Stacey has pointed this out when you look at things like the grandfather clause. That has nothing to do with race or gender, but it's completely tied to race, right? You couldn't vote before 1865 if you were African American. But ostensibly, that has to do with your allegiance to the country, how long you've been here. Um, and so states have a lot of discretion and ways to influence what the composition looks like. And the parties in charge of state elections 
have incentives to make the composition of the electrode look a certain way. As uh, Rory pointed out, if you're the, if if uh, you want to restrict certain groups from voting, generally younger, uh, lower SES, and racial ethnic minorities, then you make voting harder. And those groups are disproportionately part of the Democratic Party. If you want to make it easier for these groups to vote, if you make it easier to vote, then these groups will turn out more, and this will influence uh, what the electorate looks like. So I'm going to talk about four ways in which this is done. Uh, the first is voter registration. So voter registration had this general good idea of getting rid of corruption in elections because before voter registration people could vote early and vote often. You could vote multiple times in a day and it was pretty easy to vote. Voter registration took away the power of parties to give bribes and incentives for individuals to vote uh, by saying that you had to register to vote so only one person could vote at a time. The long-term consequence of this though is that it decreased turnout uh, in the population. And so some political scientists estimate that if you got rid of voter registration, you could increase turnout by as much as 8%. And that 8% isn't evenly spread across the population. Again, younger individuals, racial ethnic minorities, and those of a lower SES are less likely to vote the, more, the harder it is to register, the, the, the further away the registration date is from the election date. And so states have some discretion about when you have to register to vote before a general election. And this is set by the National Voter Registration Act of 1993. This says that no state can have more than, you cannot prohibit someone from registering to vote 30 days before the election, and you have to allow 18 year olds to vote. Not surprisingly, in more conservative states, that's, uh, in more conservative states, you have a longer deadline from the actual election before you have to register to vote. So in this case, the red states, you have to register by the first week of October. Uh, the, some states allow you to register and vote on election day. So even if I haven't registered to vote, I can vote on election day. And so those are states that tend to be a little bit more liberal, but not in all cases, right? So Idaho tends to be more conservative and has election day registration. Um, so when you, states can decide what they want these registration dates to look like, and this can determine who turns out to vote. And consistent with a lot of the things that I'll talk about here, this is largely driven by party and which party is in power. Uh, and some states allow you to make it, some states make it really difficult to vote, and some states make it really easy to vote. So one of the things that's becoming much more, or starting to grow in popularity, is automatic voter registration. So this uh, is, if you have any contact with government, so if I go to the DMV and I give them my driver, get a driver's license, they automatically register me unless I opt out. If I go to the Social Security Administration office uh, and I have a problem with my Social Security check, then they register me unless I opt out. And this has a large effect in terms of registration. So Oregon is one of the first states to do this. And these are the number of people registered uh, over unregistered over time. And you can see the trend tended to be upwards. And then as soon as you have this automatic voter registration, then you have a large decrease in the number of people who are unregistered, right? Uh, and this has a large, at least in the early science, has a large impact in terms of turnout. So California does this, Oregon does this, uh, and in 2018 you saw a slight increase in midterm election turnout, even above and beyond what you saw in other states, which was a large growth. Um, and for the most part, this is most, that was mostly considered in liberal leaning states. Uh, I will talk quickly about voter IDs because I think Rory covered this a lot. Uh, but for the most part, the idea came from two uh, political operatives, John Fun and Hans von Spakovsky. Uh, and they had this idea that uh, voting, was, your vote, our votes were being diluted because there were people who were voting multiple times and impersonating others in terms of voting. So this was in-person uh, voter fraud, which most studies who have tried to look at this find that there's absolutely no in-person voter fraud. It's a really tiny percentage of voter fraud. There is some voter fraud that occurs, and this is much more likely to happen with mail-in ballots. Because it's easy, not easy, but some people can forge people's signatures and then send in mail. Uh, you can also, as was the case in North Carolina, collect people's ballots after they signed it and then fill it out the way you want and send it out. So if voter fraud was the real concern, there should be more of a focus on male voter fraud. But the reality is male in voting benefits the Republican Party, so there's less of a focus on this amongst Republican states. Uh, instead, they voters on in, focus on in-voter fraud and these voter IDs because there's some hope, maybe, maybe not hope, uh, <laughs> there's some expectation that 
if you have voter ID laws, this might decrease the types of people that turn out, and ostensibly, maybe this improves uh, election transparency. So there's mixed findings about this, though, whether or not voter ID actually leads to differences in terms of voter turnout for different groups. So there were studies by Zoltan Hosnall at UCSD, uh, and he used this large data set, the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, and showed that over time, uh, if you look at the election before voter ID gets implemented and the election right after it gets implemented, then you see a decrease in turnout, particularly amongst Latinos. Uh, blacks a little bit less than whites, but Latinos are the group that's most hurt by these voter identification laws. Um, uh, Phoebe Henniger at University of Michigan and her colleagues did a similar study, and they leveraged the fact that in Michigan, you it has, it's a non-strict voter ID state. So if I go to vote uh, and I don't have a photo ID, then I can just sign an affidavit that says I do have a photo ID, and they'll count my vote. And so if you could look at those individuals who would have been turned away in other states, those who signed the affidavit, you could see whether or not they were disproportionately of one group or another. And they found that disproportionately, African Americans were less likely, were more likely to sign this affidavit. Although they found really small effects that most people had the IDs. Uh, very few people were signing the affidavits in the state of Michigan. And so opponents of voter ID laws would say that it's not solving a real problem. There's no real problem to solve here, and there are some costs. And there's the potential to disenfranchise certain groups of voters, particularly Democrat, uh, young voters, African Americans, and those of a low SES who tend to be part of the Democratic Party. Proponents point to evidence that say, well, for the most part, the evidence in social science is mixed about turnout. Uh, and other than Hajnal study and Henniger study, there's a lot of studies that show that the introduction of these voter ID laws doesn't lead to a decrease in turnout amongst African Americans or young voters. So whether or not these voter IDs are actually having any effect is in question. Uh, there's some who have argued, yes, two, okay. Mm -hmm. there we go. That's this. Okay, so Rory pointed this out. Her graph is much better than mine. So <laughs> it's the best. The, it's the best. best. So, uh, I go to voter purging, which uh, Rory also mentioned. So this is something where you do see large differences in terms of turnout. So part of the National Voter Registration Act, which I mentioned earlier, is that states can clean up their voter rolls. But they can't kick off individuals just because you haven't voted in an election. Um, but you do want to make sure that people who are dead, people who have moved out of state, are not on the voter rolls because this creates administrative problems. And so one way that Secretary of State or election commissioners deal with this is that they uh, send out postcards or things to see if you've actually lived in those states. After Shelby versus Holder County, uh, you saw a rapid increase in changes in how long before they sent out a postcard. So in Ohio, for example, if you, did, you voted in 2008, but you didn't vote in a midterm in one year or a, a mayoral election in another, which is common because most people vote in general presidential elections, then you're eligible to be kicked off the ballot if you didn't turn in your postcard. Uh, they also found that these things were sent out differently depending on county. So in some counties, they sent a little postcard that looked pretty unofficial, so of course you throw it away. In some counties, they repeatedly email you, call you, send you letters, so that there was much more of an incentive to sign it in. So this became the real big problem, I think, in this Ohio case, is that not only was it removing people much quicker than usual, but there was a real disproportionate impact of people being purged. And so 538 did an analysis of this, and you can see the counties in um, Ohio, and counties that tended to be more African American had quicker uh, rates of expulsion or uh, being purged from voters, from the voting block. Uh, so that's one way that people might do it. But I guess I'll quickly finish with felon disenfranchisement because it's another kind of voter disenfranchisement. Uh, and this comes from, this has been around for all of history. So in Kentucky in 1792, uh, if you had committed a felonious act, then you were barred from voting. And many states adopted these things throughout the 19, uh, throughout the 19th century, and then really in the 1950s and 60s, it, it, it grew a lot. Um, the funny thing about felony disenfranchisement is it's not concentrated by partisanship the same way that it is for other groups. It's mostly concentrated in the South, uh, which of course has a history of being repress repressive in some ways, uh, particularly to African Americans. The other thing that's different about felony disenfranchisement is that there seems to be some bipartisan support for getting rid of it. Uh, and so Cory Booker and Rand Paul, Cory Booker is an African American Democrat, he's running for president now. Rand Paul was a candidate who ran for president in 2016, and they've worked on some stuff to increase, to allow felons who have been uh, barred from voting to have the opportunity to vote. And Donald Trump and Kanye West, outside of talking about airplanes <laughs> made by Apple, uh, 
uh, also had some discussion about uh, uh, felon disenfranchisement. And we've also seen in Florida, for example, which has one of the most punitive laws, it's one of four states which bar you from voting after you've committed one felonious act, um, has passed Amendment 4 in the last election, which gave people the right to vote. Of course, now this is bogged down in challenges about how this should be implemented and what the voters meant when they voted on this. Uh, but it does seem, I guess if we want to have a happy ending, it does seem like this is a type of disenfranchisement that may end at some point in the future. So I'll stop. Thanks to our panelists, and now we'll throw this open to some discussion.